your chance to call in and talk sports with the region's leading sports figures. Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Kenny. Welcome to Sportsline Live. It's a quick blast of fury, an entire competition packed into about five to eight seconds. It is the science of drag racing, and there's more to it than you'll probably imagine. Something tonight for the hardcore racing fan and the fan looking for something to watch between Monday night, night football games. Our guest this evening, someone that is an engineering consultant for some of the teams that you're seeing here, and a man that races his own car in national events. From the DAM racing team in Poughkeepsie, John Satterfield is with us tonight. Uh, John, I say uh, the science of drag racing, probably to someone who's not watching this that closely, or maybe someone who watches uh, even the, the dirt racing and they see drag racing, maybe it's not evident to them the amount of time that goes into it and exactly, uh, I, I guess, the technology that goes into it now. What, what is the, uh, I guess, the latest, you were trying to explain to me before the show, what, what's the latest uh, in the sport? Is, is there always going to be the talent of the driver or is it going to be the talent of the people behind the scenes with the engines and that sort of thing? Well, that would be yes to both. Yeah. Uh, drag racing is a team sport as most racing is. You have the engineers, the manufacturers of the products, uh, you have the driver, you have the crew team, and you have the uh, crew chief. Uh, a culmination of things you learn from each event, you go home, capitulate, and try to prepare yourself for the next event, the next year, and depending on how far uh, you're looking, go into maybe the next decade. Uh, when you're engineering uh, things, you, you, you my position is we try to learn a lot about a lot of different things and you get a feel for where you need to be uh, as you're developing engine parts and you say okay you learn pressure angles and this may not make sense to you but now it's forces of working against each other and, and, and you learn about internal combustion engine the uh, thermodynamics and then you say okay what's what's obtainable you go to the racetrack and you're working there and you see the chassis working you say what's obtainable you look at short-term goals long-term goals and you say, well, what's my budget? And then you try to, to deal with that. If, you know, if your budget's limited, you try to work within that budget. If, you, if your budget's uh, unlimited, all right, you, you work in long-term uh, gains. Now, you do everything, though. I mean, your, your thing is, as, as a consultant with the, uh, the, the higher professional levels, with your car, you're one level below most Correct. of the people that you're working with. Uh, how difficult is that, or is that the fun of it, that you are, your talent is probably working with the engines and you're a professional nitpicker, you say, yes. you're looking for slight flaws or things that can be done slightly better with the engine, or uh, is that the fun of it, or would you say, you know what, I'd like to just drive and have everybody else in my million dollar budget, uh, you know, McDonald's and Skoll and everyone else take care of that for me? Uh, for me, uh, it's the tinkering, that's what I'm about. I would rather do that than just solely drive. Uh, I get my enthusiasm from the small uh, performance gains. The driving that I do gives me the correct feel for listening to the professional customer. All right. If Wayne County calls me, which is one of the people you saw on the, on the film that we do a lot of work for, Dave Hutchins in the engine department, well, if he calls somebody who had no feel for racing, uh, uh, the answers he would get back w would really not help the car go forward. Mm. All right. As we come up from the bottom, as most of the drag racers do, very few start at the top, we've got, gained a lot of experience to help answer questions. When professional drag racers are at the, t at the track, a lot of times they don't have time to try every idea. Mm. People like me will go through, and we have the, the low focus time to try ideas that may or may not work. Uh, and we can stumble and trip, and if it doesn't look so good, we're not in front of the big people with the right. big money. And, and we do trip and and fall down a few times and have to brush ourselves so up. So it can be a, a more of a testing ground, e even though you're, uh, you're at a high level of, of racing, oh, yes. but we're not talking about uh, the, the highest level. And yeah. we'll try to explain that uh, to those of you. And, you know, there's some of you out there that want to get to the nitty-gritty, and there's some of you out there who are saying, well, exactly, uh, you know, what happens here? Where, where is the different levels? Now, top fuel, we're going to look at that a little later on. We have tape of that. That's where the, the big tires in the back, tiny tires in the front, Correct. where the uh, big daddy Don Garlitz and mm -hmm. uh, Don Prudhomme and those guys... Uh, as you go down to funny cars and you get down to pro stock right. and then to your level competition Correct. eliminator. Yes. Uh, I want to start out looking at competition eliminator and uh, again you were trying to explain to me exactly what it's like on the line. We're going right. to take some tape that uh, the DAM racing team has <laughs> and try to, if you can, into, into layperson's terms if you can right. or maybe to the hardcore fan, exactly this is you at the line and we have right. this, we have a bunch of starts for you to look at. Yeah. Exactly, uh, you know, how technical 
how uh, precise is the start? You're not just pounded on, on the accelerator. No. Well, when you're preparing, as I explained before, uh, a lot of this is, is mental preparation. When you're getting up there, you're trying to do something to upset your competitor. Uh, you, you really formulate a lot of these things long before you, you come to the starting line. We'll get up there and we stage very early, which puts a lot of additional pressure on our competitor to stage. You'll, you'll get we'll, up front early and, you'll, and the exactly. guy will be behind you, right? And what we're trying to do is get him out of his rhythm, all right? I tend to be an early stager, and if you watch professional drag racing, some guys really like to stage late. Depending on what your uh, competitor is used to watching or used to doing, uh, you try to upset his, his rhythm. If a guy's used to staging late, you try to stage later. And if you've watched uh, uh, the drag racing on TV, you'll notice that sometimes there's a real controversy about who's going to stage last. Right. All right. Well, that's the fun of it. When you're getting on the starting line, what you're trying to do there is prepare to leave uh, as soon as the green, the car is in motion and going down the track. Uh, you just saw us doing a, a burnout, which was preparing the tires. We'll watch this right now, pulling to the line. I'm staging early. I, I set both lights on, and then I'm, I'm waiting for the other guy. Now I'm making him nervous. Uh, I don't know which one we're on right now, but if he's going to stage in, I'm a solo alum, but normally we, we would have some competitor, and we'd already be putting pressure on him to stage. Mm -hmm. So then, next thing I'm doing is as the car leaves the line, I'm feeling a G-force. We typically leave with about three Gs. It means my body weight is times three. And then as the car goes down the track, it comes down from three Gs, uh, and when we go into high gear, we're about two Gs. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to feel your body relax. As it goes through the gear shift, uh, if you feel the car, what we call it, nose over, it may go just below 2 Gs. It may be like 1.95 Gs. But if your body gets sensitive, you can actually feel it below 2 Gs, hit high gear, and go back to 2 Gs. Uh, someone, as we were saying before, like a Daryl Alderman, it would never hit that 1.95. Right? He shifts manually, and right. he always keeps it right on the edge because his... Uh, body sensitive. The edge being? Uh, the car's acceleration. You'll feel the car decelerate ever so slightly. Uh, it'll actually go into a negative acceleration. If you're watching the, uh, in the computer outprints, you'll see a little negative. Well, your body becomes sensitive to that acceleration feeling. Uh, if you have a street car, you feel it too. You put your foot in it, and at some mm -hmm. point, you may be going more mile an hour, but your body begins to relax against the seat okay. rather than being pinned against the seat. You want to be pinned against the seat. You want that pinning feeling, okay. all right? As soon as you feel yourself relaxing, and this is in certainly different degrees, as you're driving down the street, uh, you may reach 1G, mm -hmm. all right? You go around a corner, you may reach 2Gs. Because most cars with four tires going around a corner have I, greater G-force around a corner than they do forward. I wouldn't be aware of that, by the way. Before I get any further, guys, could you ra roll that tape back, just rack it back, and I want to take a look at it again, because right. you were explaining one part. You were explaining the psychological uh, uh, ploys that you would have against, uh, against an opponent. Right. But uh, try to explain now the chassis. You have a little give in the chassis. Yes. What, what are you doing with the tires and trying to, uh, again, you want to get it pinned back a little bit and right. then be propelled uh, up the course uh, and try to explain that to us. Okay, as you see the car leaving, we'll watch it just, just plant and leave. And the first thing, if you if you at home later on, if you're taping this, you can slow this down. During the leave, the car may seem smooth, but it never stops moving. As the car lifts the front, you watch it, it'll set down in the rear ever so slightly. But well, we study this for a year or two years, so the car never stops moving during the leave. If at any point the car stops moving, it'll spin the tires. So you're looking for the car to have a smooth, steady motion in order to have the greatest amount of forward G-forces. You don't want it to be on the wheelie bars, which are in the back, to keep the car from flipping over backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't want it to be on the front tires. You want maximum weight on the rear tires, and that will increase the footprint, we call it. And that gives the car the greatest amount of forward Gs and the greatest amount of, of, of area by, covered by the tires. Correct, and that right. gives us the lowest amount of elapsed time. So what we're trying to do is get the car, it'll touch the wheelie bars momentarily because if it didn't, it would literally flip over backwards. But we have balanced the shock absorbers and the springs. We actually send ours to an IndyCar team and they dyno these on a regular IndyCar team, a shock dyno, so that we get the greatest amount of uh, motion. We mm -hmm. can't say any one thing because there's a lot of motion in the spring rates and the shock rates. So the wheelie bars touch to keep the front end from coming up. Then it goes into a balancing act between the front tires and the wheelie bars. All right? you, want, you don't want the front tires to touch and you don't want the wheelie bars to touch. You mm -hmm. want like that to go from one end of the track to the other, right. giving you the greatest amount of traction. That's, and, that's fascinating. Again, I know it, uh, for some of you out there, it's very technical, but it's fascinating. You have to keep looking at it over and over again and see the car come back, and you have to achieve that, and, and I called it a friction point. As correct, if someone exactly. was changing gears, you know where you have your greatest strength, and you've got to get into that zone, that friction zone. Exactly. And if you can stay there, 
you're in business. That's exactly right. We've got to take a break in a second here. We have a lot more tape to look at, and uh, we're going to take a look at the top fuel guys. We're going to take a look at uh, what a really talented driver can do. Do these guys shift? Who can shift? Do you want to shift? Does a computer do it? Well, John Satterfield is here. We're talking about drag racing. We'll be back in a minute. That's it. John Satterfield at the line. Is, is that the correct terminology? <laughs> at the line. Okay, good. I'm, I'm fairly new to this stuff. Um, again, for those of you who are uh, new to it or you're wondering, uh, you know, exactly what happens with these things, again, top fuel is, is the top of the line. Again, Ultimate. that's the, the, the drag racers, the dragsters. Yes. Uh, they have funny car, pro stock, correct. competition yeah. eliminator. Yeah. And what we're going to look at right now is we're going to look at the top fuel guys as well. But let's take a look at uh, some of the pro stock cars, what a pro stock car looks like yeah. and exactly, uh, you know, what, what this level is like. Now, there's a limit on speed in this or no? No. These fellows can go as fast as their technology will carry them and their budgets. Uh, the team on my left, I don't the screen left, it's Wayne County. That's the professional teams that we work with. These are my boys, as I call them. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Hutchins, the engine builder, and I consult regularly. In fact, I was on the phone with him today. Uh, Wayne, Warren Johnson is in the other lane. They call him the professor. I feel like I'm the professor in the Wayne County deal. I'm the guy behind the scenes mm -hmm. who does the future thinking. I like to think of where we're going to be in a couple of years. And between Dave Hutchins and myself, we try to get to that point. Because when you're at this level, you usually pick up performance at five horsepower time, but you think about it in 50s and 100s. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Scott Joffrey uh, won this particular event, which you're going to see in a second. Uh, Daryl Alderman's on the near side, and uh, Scott Joffrey on the far side, and we're going to see Daryl shift it. You yeah, see, so this, this is what fascinated me. I was wondering, at the time, I'm wondering, do they shift or not? And, and watch this guy shift uh, this car right. all in, in a quarter mile. Correct. And Daryl is what I call two driver. Uh, he doesn't use, he uses the feeling of himself to know when the car is decelerating in order to shift it. Oh. There is a tack in front of him, but Daryl is a true driver. Even though he lost this race and Scott won it, uh, Daryl is my ultimate true driver. How many guys do that? How many guys actually shift? Uh, uh, well, some shift, but none with the, with the real feeling. I mean, mm -hmm. you, they'll use a tack or whatever, but you've you got to get the difference between a guy sh who does shift manually by a device and a guy shifts the car manually by feeling. Mm. All right, and there's still a difference. The tachometers, which we're all familiar with, a lot of guys shift by tack or tack light. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl shifts so solely by the feeling of these G's. Uh, the difference between a, a 3G run and a 2.9G, um, most wouldn't feel. Daryl feels these differences and able to pull the lever at the proper time to keep the car going forward. If he feels the car knows over it all, he's already grabbing the next lever. Mm -hmm. And if you watch it often enough, it actually is amusing. The car could be going sideways. It doesn't matter. This is drag racing. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl's pulling levers. Yeah. Uh, in the, in, in the round in uh, Indy, uh, he didn't get too far off the starting line, but he stayed with it so long and the slow motion he had on TV. He actually, his hands left the steering wheel, the car left so violent, went right. I mean, it was totally out of control, but he was with it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amusing to watch somebody who drives that well handle a car that sometimes uh, nobody else on earth could handle. But other guys do have an automatic. Correct. Or a, a computer that, that, the computer that exactly. will shift for them. That, that's helpful for someone who has a little less feeling. In my case, uh, um, I'm a hobby racer. Mm -hmm. All right, so to speak, and we go out there and test these ideas, and we're trying to get to be a more professional team ourselves, but within our own budget and stuff. Next year, we're going to move up and try to be a more professional uh, sp sportsman-type team, they call it, right. which is million-dollar budgets anyhow. Budget. Now, uh, well, to, to run your team, again, competition eliminator, 100 right. grand, you, you were saying? That's a low budget. That's a low budget. Right. Up to pro stock, 500 grand? Uh, a pro stock budget, and you want to try and win, you're looking at over a million. Really? If you want to win. And then top fuel? Uh, you're looking at $5 million, $7 million if you want to win. All right. Wow. Typically, you're looking at uh, top <laughs> yeah. fuel and funny car with the same kind of budget as Indy cars. And it takes the same kind of uh, lead time to do the engineering. Uh, competition eliminator, I would put more like bush racing. I okay. need to watch on NASCAR. I got right. NASCAR and then they got the Bush. Mm -hmm. All right. Same type of budgets. Depending on the events you travel to and the, you know, you're wanting to win the more the investment. Uh, there are some professional sportsman teams that may spend 500 to a million, all right? The ones that attend all the races, who try to win every race. Uh, next year, we're going to try and move up uh, because we do a lot of the engineering. I'm in a position where that saves me money, mm -hmm. and we're just trying to put in the, the material costs uh, that make the difference. And we're trying a little harder next year with lots of sacrificing that my wife and I do to try and make up that difference. And mm -hmm. next year, we're going to go uh, semi-professionals, same class, but try to go more frequently and do better. Right. 
and uh, that's where we're going. All right, we've got to take a break right now. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls, 339-6212. We know you've been waiting on the line, and we'll get to your calls when we come back. And John Satterfield is here. You want to say hello to your wife. Your wife is a big part of your team. Uh, I know Jean's that. around here someplace. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, lady? <laughs> I saw, well, she, she was talking to me today and, and, and giving this stuff out. So you guys are real, you're uh, a, a team, exactly. uh, a professional team. Uh, I lose everything. She helps me find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great if you can you combine something that you love yeah. with someone you love yeah. in your business. We're doing well. You, you've got it made. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Let's take a phone call now for John Satterfield. John from Plattic Hill. You're on Sportsline Live. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, John. Can you hear us? Okay, John. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got a Pro Street. I've got a Pro Street uh, Chevy pickup. Right, sir. And at the time, I had uh, 373 gears in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, with regular street tires. Now that it's Pro Streeted, I've got 411 gears. 33, 19.5, 15-inch tires. Right, sir. And it feels as if now with the taller tire, I've gone back to a 373. Now, I just ordered 456 gears for it. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what 33-inch height of the tire against the 456s, what my true ratio will be. Well, well, now, first of all, what would this cost him if he was going to you? I'm <laughs> just asking. Hey, John, I'm glad we could provide the service. By the way, you know, John, stay on the line there a second. Yeah, we're on a delay, so it's, it's tricky back and forth. But, yeah, you know, if, I'm, I'm glad we could uh, provide this for you. Go ahead, John. This is easy. <laughs> uh, we do this every day with our own race car because we change so many ratios. And uh, you just go back to your, your little schooling one where you get the circumference of something, uh, pi r square, uh, if I'm not too silly right now, um, not remembering it correctly, you get the circumference of your tire, then you multiply it by the old ratio, and then you get the new circumference and divide that back in, and it'll give you the new ratio. So you're just, you know, doing basic formulas. You just try to find a circumference of the tire, <laughs> and you divide that by the ratio, and then you get the other tire diameter, and you divide that back in, and it'll give you the new ratio. We do it all day long, because I, I go to a track with several different diameter tires, and we always want to keep the ultimate ratios the same. So we just get our calculators out and do it that yeah. way ourselves. My math is so bad. So, you know, kids, if you're out there and you want to race, you pay attention to your math teacher. You thought yeah. it was silly. No. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anything else? Johnny, you still there? Yes, I am. Oh, John, anything else? Uh, uh, where do you do most of your running at? We travel at national events. Uh, we were just at Reading, Pennsylvania, when they used to have the Quebec race. In fact, that was one of my favorites. We run there. We've run Gainesville, Indianapolis, uh, U.S. Nationals. Uh, the national events, we were at the Mopar race. We did pretty good there. So we, te we test locally, but we race nationally. Okay, do we have time for another call in this segment? Yeah, we do. All right, AJ from Middletown. AJ, you're on Sportsline Live. Remember, you're on delay. Give us your question, and then we'll address it. Okay, uh, my question is to John. Um, yes, do you ever think that Lebanon Valley Speedway will ever um, have an uh, NHRA event? Uh, they just did. If you missed it, uh, the same weekend as Woodstock, we had the first divisional at Lebanon Valley. Uh, I had not participated there for a lot of years because I wasn't fond of the track. We'd go up there once every five to ten years just to get aggravated. Why? What's wrong? Uh, the, the track wasn't well kept. Okay. But they have new owners up there who have made an extreme aggressive approach to trying to get this up. They spent a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We went to this divisional race ourselves to see what it was like. We are very likely to call that home track now really? and go up and do testing. Uh, uh, we like it and we want the, the, the novice racer to understand something. When we travel around the country, we find what we call good air tracks and bad air tracks. Uh, right now, the air is quite good and makes the car naturally go fast. It's what we call God-given horsepower. Uh, and then sometimes on a hot, humid day, would make it go slower. Well, Lebanon is a bad air track. You may go a little slower there because of the atmospheric conditions, but the track has improved. And the thing that we're going to go there for is because it's a bad air track. To if we, test. To test. Right. Because if you can go fast in bad air, you can go fast anywhere. Mm -hmm. Period. So that's why we're thinking uh, if they keep it up and it looks really good, they spent about $4 million on this thing, right. and they've made it an excellent track, we're going to start testing there on Saturdays ourselves. All right. Yeah. Talk about details now when you're talking good air, bad air, and that sort of thing as well. You've got to take it into consideration. Right. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to take a look at some uh, top fuel cars. John and AJ, thanks for the phone calls. We'll be back in a minute. All right, 
back with uh, John Satterfield. I've enjoyed this uh, half hour. Educational uh, for me as well. And yeah. only a, a day or two now. I watched Speed Week last night, you tonight, and, and I'm all set. I know what I'm doing. Uh, take a look at some top fuel cars. Yeah. And, and again, this is the pinnacle of the sport. You were telling me that actually these cars are less expensive than a lot of the funny cars that are out there. Correct. Uh, because the chassis, these are, well, might seem modestly expensive, maybe only forty-five dollars or $50,000 for the chassis. But the real maintenance cost is when they expire an engine, like you just saw one expire. If they, if they get to those fireballs that you see, that may be fifty or $60,000. And they may have to go through this for their sponsorship uh, exposure. Several of these uh, hand grenades in an event. If you've seen John Forsey's ruined entire cars, and that may be as much as a hundred thousand dollars worth of a hit mm -hmm. and uh, in one race so you're looking at uh, the McDonald's arches or whatever and they're looking for the TV exposure and a 30 second commercial sometimes may cost them a couple hundred grand if they're in front of the TV there for a couple of minutes they feel for 200 grand they got a, a bargain sure so a uh, marketing and, and uh, exposure is real important to the sport uh, this is Don Perdone this is his last year as a driver he's been doing real well this year uh, in this final here, I believe, is coming up. He's running Corey Mack. Oh. Yes, he did. And this is a race that uh, Brian said he liked a lot because they were really close at the end. <laughs> uh, Corey Mack won the thing. Uh, these well, are the kind of races I like. You see, because i got to point out, my perception of, of drag racing was that you get to a final, somebody's going to blow it. <laughs> One guy will just coast across, and the other guy, boom, and, he, and, he's, and he's out. Right. And, that's, and, of course, now that's, uh, that's kind of like a Super Bowl theory. One team will blow it. One team, because of the added pressure, saying, we can't just be ourselves in this race or right. in this game. We've got to be better, because look who I'm facing. And I, it's psych, you know, the psychology of it, people... Uh, I don't, you won't say choke, but you try to outperform what you're able to do. Well, in that analogy, I would say in the Super Bowl, it's the Hail Mary at the end. Mm -hmm. See, the, the drag racing in the final, that's only the last play of the game. When you t really right. understand drag racing, you have to go back and understand it may be a two-a-year event. Uh, uh, the preparation and everything is long before that last one. That's the last play of the game, that final. Mm -hmm. well, all the other plays before it set that last one up. And if you feel you've got to throw a Hail Mary to win a football game, that ball's in the air. You're and in it's trouble. A, right. And it's yeah. gone. Maybe, maybe right. not. Right. Well, sometimes a guy's going to throw that Hail Mary in the last one, and he's going to smoke those tires. Mm -hmm. But it's the preparation and everything it took to get to that place, and he really wants to win the event. Mm -hmm. He wants to show his sponsorship the right amount of time. Uh, and he wants to have his team happy. They go home with a smile so that anything goes. I mean, if you get up there and load it up, that's it. It's on its way. John, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Brian, thank uh, you. Oh, pleasure. Good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night. Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Kenny. Welcome to Sportsline Live. It's over in about five seconds. A blast of fire, smoke, and a few seconds later, it's over. What happens in those few seconds to the man behind the wheel is described by our guest tonight as exhilarating. Man and machine tonight in drag racing. And we welcome back to Sportsline Live. Let's let these cars get off the block. John Satterfield is with us, and he is from the DAM Machine Shop in Poughkeepsie. Good to have you back, John. Hi, Brian. Uh, you know, we just scratched the surface last time we had you on here, and we were talking about, uh, you know, mi mostly machines, mostly uh, about G-Force, mostly yeah. about how to get the most out of your car. I want to start tonight, and again, 339-6212, and, and call in and learn how to get more horsepower from your car, so people want to know when they call in. Uh, first, though, about those few seconds in the car, and you're reacting. You've told me before that uh, those five seconds just expand to the point of where you can recount things one after another, and yet it is only five, six, or seven seconds. Right. Well, uh, what it takes is about uh, 45 minutes before the prior to the run where you're actually winding yourself up. I was trying to think of an analogy that would be uh, familiar to most. It's like increasing the number of frames per second so that when you play it at normal speed, mm -hmm. it actually is quite slow. So a driver gets in a mode for probably, uh, in my case, it's, uh, it's 45 minutes to an hour before where you're actually mentally speeding yourself up, increasing your, your frames per second. Until the time you pull to the starting line, you may be doing 1,000 frames per second. All right? Uh, well, right now, you're pretty frantic. You're up on the ends of your nerves. But when you get through with the run, you play that back at normal speed. And you can really uh, dissect that uh, quite individually. All right? And it may take you another 45 minutes to an hour to uh, wind back down to a normal speed. Mm -hmm. All right? But you have captured all of that information in those thousands of frames just as if it was a couple of hour event. All right? So when you see it, like I said last time, John Forrest gets out and he's pointing and yelling and screaming. Right. Well, you've got to realize he may be explaining to you in one frame per second. 
Right. But it happened at, at 10,000 frames per second. Mm -hmm. So he's pulling back the 20,000 or 30,000 bits of information that he gathered during that run. All right, we do the same thing, and that's what allows you to see the light as a bulb and the filament comes on and you cut the lights and you're feeling all those actions in the car because now you're really w working on 1,000 or 2,000 frames per second. Uh, John Force and the speeds he runs, probably he runs a couple of 1,000 frames per second faster than I right. do, but, but that's the uh, best analogy for someone who really wants to understand what's going on in the car. It's a heightened experience, uh, exactly. basically. It's just, there's just much more happening. You have to get yourself slowly up to that level, yes. which takes years, I, I would figure. Correct. When you're first going out, I can remember the experiences. Uh, when I was first going to the national event, I would be so scared. Both of my legs, I, got a, I was driving a standard at the time, a clutch would be on one, and the gas would be over here, and they would be shaking so bad yeah. I couldn't hardly hold them <laughs> down. Well, you take and learn how to turn that adrenaline and finally speed up your mental function. Mm -hmm. You're going up with the same amount of enthusiasm, just like coming in on, on, on a sat here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, you come with the same nervousness, but you hope at least you'll get through it a little easier each time and you use that nervousness to, uh, to help you through it. Well, drag race is the same thing. Every time you pull up to the thing, you're equally as nervous as I was the first time that I was at the event. Mm -hmm. All right? But you begin to focus a little better. You begin to use that adrenaline beforehand to bring your frames per seconds up. Mm -hmm. So then when you go down, now you can analyze it better. So you redirect the same energies. It's fine. I, know, I, I think of that myself. Sometimes uh, even to, if I can possibly compare it to what I do, and you can't, it doesn't happen that quickly. But sometimes you'll have something in your head, and before you're about to say it, you're on your next thought. Correct. And you're saying your next thought. Mm -hmm. And you realize, and I'll get home and I'll be trying to explain to my wife what I was saying. I said, you know what? I knew what I was saying, but I, I was already bored with it, and I already went to the next <laughs> thing, and I had no idea what I was saying at the time when I was actually saying it. I do know what I'm saying now, though. 339-6212, that's the sports line. Uh, John brought some new tape for us to look at, and again, we break this down uh, for the hardcore person, the person that's trying to uh, really learn about cars. Right. Uh, I learned an awful lot when you were back here, and again, about G-Force and about the car and lift, and when you see someone's wheels coming up high and, whoa, and they take off, that's bad. That's bad. You don't want that. No. What you really want to do is keep the, atti the attitude of the car relatively level, but gain maximum traction. Oh, they're showing some of the yeah. film now. It's up now. Uh, what you really want to try and do is keep the left front tire uh, only a few inches off the ground for the longest period of time. And some of the tapes, uh, which you can't see here now, we have the front tire marked. We can actually carry the left front to the near the eighth. Uh, these particular runs were the runs the following weekend after we were here last in Virginia. I have a, a friend of mine driving the car for the first time in my racing career, actually someone else driving my car, so we can begin to analyze some of our problems. That's uh, myself in the background there. Uh, this is a unique experience to be outside of your own car watching you go down, uh, but it was quite educational. Now, see, that lifts up. Now, you, that's Correct. a little bit of lift. You don't want that. Or th is that inevitable? You're going to have well, some. Just a little lift you're seeing is fine here in these uh, films. It's really good. Now, that particular run we're at now, yes. Uh, that's, this is the, my best ever pass in my life. You see both wheels carrying uh, significantly. That's actually bad, and we'll have to go back and tune that out of the car, but this was my fastest ever pass. What we had learned from uh, the G-meter in the car and going down to Virginia is that we were actually leaving the starting line, the first motion at the starting line was actually too many Gs. Mm -hmm. uh, too much power to start. Too much power. Uh, you hear the uh, top fuel mention, they smoked the tires, whatever. Well, we really never thought that a 310 cubic inch engine with single four barrel could exhibit too much performance at the starting line. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who follow racing and especially talk to me, I usually talk about my problems quite a bit. We were fighting a fuel system problem against G-forces for most of a season and a half, which is pretty frustrating. Mm -hmm. When we went down to Virginia with someone else in the car, we could actually see the front tire pick up, set down, and, then and pick up again. So we tried to analyze between the, uh, the, the uh, strips that come out of the computer and try to figure out what was going on. The best we could figure is that the carburetor couldn't function over 2.9 Gs. So we went to the testing session at Englishtown. They said, well, what can we do to keep the car from leaving at that much force? So they have rev limiters in these cars to keep them from having engine damage. We have a two-stage rev limiter. So we're able to have two different individual levels of rev limit. Mm -hmm. and, and electrically activated, we could keep it in one rev limit while sitting at the starting line. So the engine is way below its power performance levels. And then while we're sitting there, we'd let go of this, the same motion, we'd let go of the car. So now it wasn't making the power it normally would, and actually hurt the engine's initial lead, the very first thing it does. Well, the fact that it wasn't reaching 3Gs at that moment, in the, in the later uh, video there, you could see the car actually lift higher. Because now the car was leaving under the power it would normally see, it wasn't hurting itself. The carburetor was uh, uh, not acting ill. So if the car, again, and uh, in layman's terms, Correct. the car going up 
at, at full throttle, going out with that much force, actually pins the fluids back. Everything Correct. comes back. It doesn't operate at, at its best capacity. Correct. As we're speaking, I thought of a good analogy. When I had on TV and a guy spun in the uh, thing that, for G-force and he blacks out, mm -hmm. car went to black out. All right, too many G-forces, car mm -hmm. couldn't handle it. It just blacked out. All right, it only has to happen for a couple of moments, but that's a very critical part of track, and it, and it hurts, crucially hurts it for ET. All right now, we keep it under what it would normally black out at. Mm -hmm. All right, a little slower to start. A little slower start keeps it under yeah. faster overall, critically faster overall, mm -hmm. not just a little bit. We were four miles an hour over the eighth mile record, and to give you an idea, uh, if you could go a half a mile an hour, well, that would be fantastic. Yeah. We were four miles an hour over the eighth mile record, which means that it was a land rocket. I mean, we were thrilled. Mm -hmm. uh, that particular weekend, the track was uh, not very good. Just pro just after the starting line, and three cars wrecked uh, prior to us, so we weren't able to grab to hold the traction to really lay down an excellent pass. But it was, it was our best ever pass of our lifetime, and, and the portion of the track was good. It was just an absolute land rocket. We were thrilled. Wow, so a breakthrough, a major a breakthrough. Major breakthrough. We've got to take a break. 339-6212, John Satterfield is here. We'll take your phone calls when we come back. Sportsline Live the rest of this week. Tomorrow we'll have open lines. On Friday, we'll talk soccer with Ron Valley. Next week, on Monday, it'll be NBA night with Rich Rinaldi. On Tuesday, AAA baseball player Jeff Pierce, right from uh, this area, from Dutchess County, played for DCC. And he is with the AAA uh, club uh, Pawtucket with uh, the Boston Red Sox. Wednesday, open lines on Sportsline Live. Thursday, Doug Short will be here. He does video views, football, and the movies as we get ready for the Super Bowl, and we'll have our Super Bowl preview on Friday night before that weekend hits. John Satterfield is with us right now. We're going to take a few phone calls and talk racing before we look at some more tape, try to explain it for you, enlighten you a little bit on the sport and the science. Pete from Poughkeepsie. Pete, you're on Sportsline Live. Go ahead. Good evening, guys. John, you're an excellent uh, representative of drag racing. Um, are you the guy that used to have the um, street eliminator or comp eliminator, Vega? I didn't Is that you, a street eliminator Vega? Is uh, that what you... I once had a comp eliminator Monza. Mm -hmm. uh, we sold that a few years ago. Before we had gotten the Trans Am, it was just not competitive anymore because of aerodynamic changes and chassis changes. Peter, you still there? I don't... Uh, yes, I don't want to dominate the phone line. I know other people are on. But, John, my question is, um, could the possibility of a drag racing club for a lot of guys that race in the summertime on the street do a burnout from a you know on the arterial from block to block versus that could there be a designated area once or twice a week where all the guys even the youth that are doing nothing now they can get interested in to me the best sport in america drag racing well yeah where can you race, ra drag race if you if you're around and i, I don't know if i want them on the arterial doing that well, <laughs> no 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 but i yeah i mean it'd be nice if there was a place where you could do that is there such a place yes there is a reason for price uh, and safe. Lebanon Valley is just recently refurbished. It's not a commercial, but I really believe the safest place is where it's safest. Mm -hmm. and, and you go to Lebanon Valley, and I think they run Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays uh, for 5 or $7. Uh, they have uh, ambulances there in case there ever is a catastrophe. There's also people around that can give you help. And, and truly, it's not that far away uh, from the area. So th the best thing is, is to stay away from the street because some individual could come up and accidentally get hurt. Uh, these cars are running at the limits of, of technology and something could break and, and, and literally take a life. So mm -hmm. you want to do it where it's the safest and if something uh, misfortunate happens, there's medical help available. So I never suggest uh, racing on the street. Uh, street racing when done by Indy cars, and we'll, they always close off the areas. If you could get a city to close off an entire area and support it relative to medical, uh, that would be fine. Outs yeah. Outside of that, I'm against it. Yeah, I, I think that's what Pete was talking about. And thanks for the call, Pete. I think Pete wants, like, you know, Grand Prix of Detroit where the, the city stops. And, you know, he wa if you want one big four-lane strip where guys could do that, uh, that's pretty expensive, though. I, if, if, if it's out there, I guess you could, uh, you could try to impress upon, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your zeal for the sport to the uh, legislature. I think it's going to be a tough call that will shut, shut Poughkeepsie down and, uh, and drag race through the streets. I'm not against uh, yeah. doing something like that. I think, so, you know, if the municipality could support it, mm -hmm. uh, at least for, like he was saying, used to have it in uh, Grand Unions. They used to have little uh, road racing things going on. Yeah. You know, a 60-foot burnout area or something like that where you got 60 feet for a start, uh, which is not 
too out of control and several hundred feet for safety and several hundred feet in every direction well supported by a city uh, it could be a fun thing mm -hmm. so you have to get a city to support it obviously yeah. uh, actually you know I remember them shutting down I think it was the Market Street area once for cycling there was the Poughkeepsie correct. 200 whatever it was with the uh, cycling correct. which is you know you, know, you can't blow up or spin out or hit, or hit people, that sort of thing. But, yeah, the city's been closed down for other things. So I, I won't rule it out, Pete, if that's what you want. We'll go to Jacques from Poughkeepsie now. Jacques, you're on Sportsline Live. Go ahead. Yeah, first, Brian, I'd like, you to, I'd like to give my regards to your family. And, John, if you have a family, I'd like to give you them your regards, too. I'd like to talk about uh, the danger involved with drag racing. I know that uh, Michael Irvin got in a crash over the last winter, and he came back and even was able to play for the Cowboys. Right. Michael or yeah, and what? But he wasn't racing, was? I mean, he was in his <clears throat> passenger car, I believe. Was that? He was in his. He was in his car. I think just uh, a couple of the Cowboys actually, one week after another, right. uh, well, came the, out. There has been some uh, basketball players that taken up drag racing and what have you. But we'll speak to the uh, danger issue first off. Uh, anytime you're in a race car, it's absolutely dangerous. People do get killed in this. It's a rare, but it does happen. Mm. Uh, the sanctioning bodies uh, develop rules to eliminate what seems to be every possible cause of an accident. Every time th they have an accident, and I have seen this personally when we go to Indianapolis, they'll take an accident that happened a year, and they have all the safety people there studying it in unbelievably slow motion. Then they'll make new rules to allow for the human safety. Sometimes they'll develop the car to break away from uh, the critical human error. Uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tubing keeps changing, and as the cars go faster, they make uh, better safety restraints. Uh, I'm encapsulated in my car in what they call a funny car cage, which was taken from a car from like John Force or Top Fuel. And, and the rules said you got to a certain speed, you had to have the same safety that a Top Fuel car is in my car. And I'm completely encapsulated all the way down to my toes with bars running around my body, over my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I have a 5 OAC harness, comes up from the crotch, so you can't slip out from the bottom. You can take one doozy of a shot in these things and, and live through it. And there's a, what's the limit? Three, is it 300 miles an hour? Or is that uh, like rocket rocket cars? Uh, that's the limit on those. What about top fuel? What's the limit on those? Uh, bon Bernstein just went 314 at the uh, World Finals, so there is no speed limit at the at the time, so long as it remains safe. What they'll end up doing is making rules around safety, like when the cars were doing the, what's called blowovers. Uh, they seem to have that under control, but the uh, insurance company got quite nervous and actually had a rule change relative to try and keep the speeds down, but of course mm -hmm. all racers find ways to get around it. Right. All right, they were having serious blowovers and they were worried about the fans being injured. But they proved that uh, every time there is one of these blowovers, the car always goes down track, the fans are not a, at risk. Because you've got to remember, the, the biggest risk is not usually the driver, it's the fan. Really? Yes. Uh, the, 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 yeah. When the, something happens, uh, even in NASCAR, uh, if the car was ever to get into the crowd, it can create serious damage. Yeah. So they do everything they can to make sure the damage. Now we have concrete barriers at all the racetrack going down both sides of the car that really inhibit the uh, the ability for the car to get into the fan area. So when you look at the uh, car relative safety, what now they're trying to do is the car's pretty safe for the driver. They're trying to make it safety for the spectator. Mm -hmm. And Jacques, uh, talk about family, and thanks for the, the kind words. Uh, your wife, Jean. Yes, she's a, here. A huge part uh, of his team. Yeah. And we, we don't even, we, when we're booking John and talking, but we just talked to Jean. <laughs> we don't even talk to John. We've got to take a break. 339-6212. More phone calls in a minute. Look at John Satterfield's car right there. Uh, Dennis and Mike, the guys on our crew here, just said when you when you drive your car, you know, around the streets, how fast do you drive? Speed limit, just a little mm -hmm. above. People think I'm kidding. I hate speeding tickets. I feel like it's a real waste of time. And then the next question, the follow-up question to that was, do you feel like you're going slow? Parked. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's life in the slow lane in, in reality, huh? That's it. Well, I, I really don't like the, uh, the annoyance that goes with the speeding tickets. Mm -hmm. um, for the few moments it takes to get there a little quicker. We, we start out that much earlier. You're a professional, though. You don't need to show up in the streets. and uh, Not really. Relax. Besides, I realize it's... What do you drive? Uh, well, I have a van, mm -hmm. which is a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time when we go around, my wife has a Jack Roush Thunderbird that we drive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually her car. Uh, I drive whatever has wheels. You know, yeah, oh, that's interesting. That's so, yeah. That if I don't drive a fast car, I don't drive fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've had Corvettes, and I've had all the fast things. You know what? Your foot's in the throttle, you get tickets. It's just not what I need. Okay, well, you've, you've got a license, though, still. Yeah, this yes. doesn't pass problems. All right, <laughs> no, no, no. get to the phone lines. May from High Falls. May, you're on Sportsline Live. Yes, good evening. Uh, what is the level of octane used in racing cars 
And are there ever any fuel booths used in the vehicles that are considered illegal? Uh, well, the octane levels that we run are, are 114 to 118. And the, uh, about illegal. Now, depending on what you consider illegal, illegal regular to regular street use or illegal regular to racing? Well, the answer is yes, they always try to do a little something to make the car have an advantage. But the uh, racing bodies have gone a long ways to try to eliminate these advantages uh, that you can add to the fuel but with the oxygen agents and dielectric checks. And I mean, they almost have a little scientific thing going on mm -hmm. with their races. Uh, reference to leaded fuels. Uh, racing is the only thing where leaded fuels are now uh, able to be run, but in the very near future, we will not be able to run leaded fuels also. Uh, lead is dangerous, and it's recognized uh, uh, where it's being eliminated even from lawnmowers in California. So uh, whatever the racing is running now that is not currently legal for the street will be eliminated, but yes, anytime a race...